Good evening, everyone. I think we'll start. Uh, my name is Craig Jeffrey. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to, to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which uh, the University at Parkville is based, the Wurundjeri people, and acknowledge their elders past and present. And also acknowledge the important relationship that the University of Melbourne has established with the Aboriginal community. I would like um, maybe to, to start by, by talking about what I was thinking about as I was walking over here through the um, rain and cold of the Melbourne summer. Um, first of all, I was thinking about sort of how I was feeling about the presentation and also thinking about, uh, secondly, its themes. And when I was thinking about how I was feeling about the presentation, I was remembering a, a, a very funny Twitter feed that, that I follow, um, which has got various reviews of, of academic papers and books on it. And one of them, um, one, one was a, a little extract from a review that someone had written about a paper. And it said, this paper makes three claims. The first claim we have known for years. The second claim we have known for decades. And the third claim we have known for centuries. And this somehow spoke to my anxieties about talking about student mobility, and particularly in front of a group, many of whom have a lot more practical experience and intellectual experience with respect to thinking about student mobility between Australia and other countries, including between Australia and India, and a certain trepidation about providing my own gloss ideas and recommendations in relation to a theme that many of you will have thought about in a great deal more detail. So in that spirit, I wanted to make sure that I only spoke for about half an hour, 40 minutes, to allow a, a good amount of time for questions and discussions and in order to uh, make sure that we hear uh, some of your ideas as well as some of mine. And the second thing I was thinking about when I was coming over was, a, was, was an experience, and it's really sort of um, biographical. When I was at school, I was always taught that when someone walked into the room, uh, particularly an adult, I think it was only an adult, not another child, when an adult walked into the room, you stood up. This is what you did, you stood up. And uh, this was drilled into me from the age of about six. Uh, and I noticed even after I finished at school, and it went all the way through school, when an adult used to walk into the room, I used to stand up. I mean, it was just actually just instinctive. I stood up. I, st I still do uh, quite often. That's just the, the response. And it, it made me, sort of, sort of later when I was reading social theory, think about the extremely, I think, incisive way that um, the, uh, the theorist Pierre Bourdieu describes uh, social life. And one of the key concepts for the, uh, some, some of this, Amanda and, and, and Priya and others know this very well, but one of, the, one of the key concepts that Bourdieu uses in his work is the idea of the habitus. He argues that everyone has this system of dispositions, tastes, inclinations, bodily reflexes that are, uh, that are Sort of situated in, in, in the body that are formed often during childhood and which continue to inform the way that we act in later life, often in ways that are just quite reflexive and, and subconscious or pre-conscious. And, and Bourdieu also starts to reflect in his work on how the habitus can continue to inform our systems of dispositions and habits and reflexes, can continue to operate even when they're no longer relevant. So, you know, I might stand up even in a context where it's not necessarily appropriate or necessary. And he refers to this with reference to this idea of the hysteresis of the habitus. And he gets this word hysteresis, I may not be pronouncing it right, but he gets it from geology. So in the University of Melbourne's terms, this is a sort of collision between geology and social theory. And the geological idea is that, uh, or notion is that when rocks are deposited in the ground, the, the iron in them tends to point to magnetic north at, at the particular point at which they solidified. So you can date the age of rocks by looking at where the iron is pointing because ma the magnetic north is constantly moving. Uh, and, and so he's, when, when, a, when a, a, a rock is uncovered with pointing to a, an, to a magnetic north where it was before, they can say, well, it's of this, this age. And he refers to this as, as the hysteresis. And so the habitus um, is, operates in a similar way. It's formed at a certain moment, 
and then um, continues to inform practice even where the magnetic north or the conditions have changed. And I found this very useful in my own work in studying uh, the, the decisions that people make around education because often people are making decisions around education in India, at least in the area where I was working in, in the early 2000s, with reference to the notion that their children would get government jobs which no longer actually existed either at the state level or the central level. So they were orienting their money, their social effort, their energy on a day-to-day -day basis to a, a goal, uh, uh, to, to an idea that was no longer realistic. And, and Bourdieu would refer to this as a sort of hysteresis effect. I was thinking about that because I think where I'm going to get to in 30 minutes' time is a, a, a concern with actually how one tries to address the the, what, what we might refer to as the institutional habitus of universities, the kind of ways in which the university, university's practices accrete uh, and develop their own logic, which may be very difficult to change. And it ties in quite neatly with uh, an argument that Glyn Davis makes in his new book on uh, Australian universities. He uses, of course, the much more common analogy I don't think it's quite as good for what I want to talk about anyway, but he uses the, the common analogy of the typewriter and the QWERTY loop on the typewriter was designed when, uh, on a keyboard, was designed when people didn't want the keys to get stuck. You know, it, it's, it, it deliberately takes quite a long time to write words on a keyboard. Uh, uh, but then when, when we moved from typewriters to computers, no one changed the keyboard because everyone was used to it, had learned to touch type with that arrangement. So we're stuck with a system that doesn't really make sense. Again, the sort of hysteresis effect in this case in relation to technology. And, and Glyn Williams is talking about this, sorry, Glyn Davis is talking about this in the context of you know, sometimes the difficulty of universities changing course to reflect new conditions. In the presentation I gave last year on, um, in fact, I think it was this year, but it's the previous round um, of presentations on, social, on um, student mobility between Australia and India, I uh, stress the need for a bold, a creative uh, and imaginative approach to thinking about student mobility between Australia and India. And one of the recommendations I made was that we might think about the relationship between, social, between spatial mobility, between the movement of students between Australia and India, and social mobility, the movement of students uh, through social hierarchies, the movement of students from situations which might be interpreted as disadvantaged to greater social inclusion. I want those messages of the need for a bold and creative approach and the need to think about mobility in its two common senses of spatial mobility and social mobility to inform also uh, the, the way that we approach the topic um, this evening. What I want to do in particular is uh, start just by providing some basic definitions, trying to really illustrate the complexity of the topic of student mobility or remind us about its complexity. Uh, and I don't claim to be able to represent the full complexity, but I think it's important that we remember that there are different types of mobility that we're talking about. And to provide some very general context to any approach to student mobility between Australia and India. And I want to provide some sort of positive context and also talk about some of the challenges associated with the context in which efforts to improve student mobility are taking place. Uh, I then want to talk about inbound in the sense of uh, uh, Indian students coming to Australia and also outbound Australian students going to India mobility and again think about some of the uh, reasons for being optimistic about inbound and outbound student mobility and its chances of increasing, but also some of the reasons perhaps to be pessimistic, to uh, reflect on the challenges associated with encouraging student mobility in both directions. I then want to make some you know, really quite concrete recommendations to government uh, who are listening and to uh, universities, uh, particularly universities in Australia rather than universities in India, 
Then I want to talk, um, and, and this is where I'll get back to that idea of the hysteresis of the habitus and, and the, the conceptual notion I just introduced to you. I want to talk about some of the headwinds, some of the challenges actually in implementing or making good on those recommendations. And then um, fifth, there's a little fifth here where I want to, to open it up for questions and have a discussion, which I'm sure will be the most interesting bit of, of this evening. And um, we'll finish around about seven o'clock. So some key obvious distinctions, just to make sure we're all um, across this. Obviously, um, not obviously, but to let you know, I want to think about both inbound and outbound uh, student mobility. And of course, the two issues are, are connected. Uh, so the movement of students but from, from India and, uh, to Australia and vice versa. I think it's important to think about the different levels at which student mobility can take place to think about the, the mobility of school students, of undergraduates, of master's students, of PhD students. Think about the movement of early career researchers, whether they be postdocs uh, or people with faculty positions. And then going into faculty mobility, thinking about mid-career and senior faculty mobility. And one of the themes this evening will be the sort of the, thinking about the, um, the way in which faculty mobility might catalyze student mobility. Also, it's important, I think, to make some distinctions between the length of time that m over which mobility takes place. So make the distinction between what I've referred to here as type A uh, student mobility, uh, short, intensive uh, experiences of traveling either to India or to Australia. And those could be from as little as a day, I suppose, to about uh, two weeks. Uh, but then one could think about also term or semester to one year. Uh, type B mobility, and then type C mobility, uh, two to four year whole programs, whether that be an undergraduate program, a master's, two year master's program, or a PhD. And then in relation to C in particular, one needs to then distinguish between what in sociological theory you'd call circular migration, where someone has a mobility experience and comes back, or um, permanent, uh, a permanent move, so where the experience of, of traveling as it is usually from Australia to India, becomes the precursor to, re sorry, from India to Australia, becomes the precursor for then settling in that country. So C1 would be a view to returning and C2 with a view to staying. Also, of course, I suppose one can imagine a situation where people have multiple short intensive experiences. So, um, Again, some really obvious points, but I think in some ways it's, it's important to just reiterate these obvious points at the beginning of a, of a presentation on student mobility. I mean, the first obvious point is that we're talking about two countries that are extremely different socially, economically, and in terms of education. So the differences are partly numeric. The, these different versions of these... Uh, demographic statistical bon mots are given at different times in different contexts but you know one of them is that there are more nine-year-olds in India than there are people in Australia another one is that the rounding error associated with any demographic estimation in India is bigger than the population of Australia Delhi has more people than there are in Australia in terms of students who are 34 million uh, young people studying they are almost all young studying in Indian higher education uh, and there are only 1.4 million in tertiary education rather there are only 1.4 million in Australia so obvious asymmetry in terms of the numbers but also really important asymmetry in terms of the economic and social standing of the students in both countries so the GDP per capita of Australia is seven times as large as the GDP capita of India. And I think it's also worth bearing in mind that a lot of what most people in Australia, not everybody, but what most people in Australia take for granted in terms of access to, uh, to a reasonable standard of health care, to a reasonable standard of basic and secondary education, is, is beyond the reach of, of a lot of people in, in India. There's low mutual knowledge. In, in Australia, there has been a disinvestment in Indian studies over the past 30 years, some degree of reinvestment in the past five years, I think. Look at something like languages. There were 
I think either four or six, depending, and I'm trying to, with Rob and Jeffrey, trying to get to the bottom of this at the moment, uh, I think there were either four, possibly six universities in 1996 that, that taught an Indian language in Australia, and now there are two, which is pretty shocking given the huge increase in importance of Australia, of, of India to Australia, and the, the recent migration of, in, of Indians to Australia, tripling of the India-born population uh, in Australia over the last 11 years. And, and I think that this, this low knowledge base creates a series of, of problems in how India is discussed. Not, of course, everywhere, but there is a, a tendency, I think, in, in some circles to sort of invoke this idea of, of Indian culture, which I am, am, am increasingly recoil from as a, as a concept. I mean, you don't talk about European culture. You don't talk about oceanic culture. Why are we talking about Indian culture? It's often also associated with this sort of rather old Orientalist idea that some parts of the world are very uh, flexible, tr you know, fleet of foot, uh, moving around a lot, and other parts of the world, which in this case can, includes India, are static, timeless. They have culture, we have history. Now, I was talking to someone recently who was talking about, anyway, no, I won't tell that story. There's, I think this problem of Indian culture is really quite, quite um, this sort of invocation of Indian culture as something static and not, not acknowledging um, diversity is quite problematic. And I think it, it, it either, in some cases, leads to sort of unhelpful approaches to um, issues like student mobility, or it leads to a sort of paralyzing concern over um, not having the right approach, as if, there's, you know, as if culture is something very sort of static and brittle, and that you know, entering it risks sort of causing huge amounts of offense. You, know, you can't, can't go into the village if you're wearing a cap, or you know, it's sort of very, very um, problematic ideas there. There are other, um, I think, reasons to be um, pessimistic at a general contextual level about possibilities for rapidly improving student mobility. One of them is the institutional and policy situation in India, the fact that the Foreign Education Institutions Bill has stalled in Parliament. Uh, I'll, I'll provide a caveat to this in a moment, but it means that uh, foreign institutions can't develop a, a, a major physical presence, at least it's very difficult to develop a major physical presence or a campus in India, which of course might be one way to very rapidly uh, increase possibilities for student mobility each way. And also, um, we need to just acknowledge uh, and continue to acknowledge, I, I make no apology for mentioning this in pretty much every presentation I make on this topic, the, the weakness of the Indian higher education system viewed as a whole. Of course, there are elite institutions and lots of excellent examples of Australian universities developing links with those elite institutions, but we need to acknowledge also that the state-run universities, the state colleges, which are often um, of quite poor quality and face major challenges in terms of curriculum, in terms of facilities, funding and governance. And we also need to, to mention Indian isolation. So there are only 39,000 international students in India. From a personal perspective, Perspective. I spent a lot of time working in a college in the city of Meerut, which uh, has a hostel that used to be reserved for foreign students, particularly for students from Nepal, Nepal uh, to come and, and study. And now that, that hostel is entirely made up of local students because no one would come to that college anymore uh, from outside India to study. So there are only 39,000 international, student, 39, international students in India in Indian high, uh, tertiary education, and most of those are from other South Asian countries or from African countries, and they're often connected to technical agreements between India and that other country. There are 230,000 Indian students outside India. Now, that sounds very impressive until you remember there were 34 million uh, Indian students overall. It's, a, it's a, a figure that's about a third of the figure of international students from China, despite the fact that China only has a very slightly larger uh, student population of 42 million. So that's why I refer to Indian isolation. Uh, I'll skip over that. Um, positives. So I think there are also some reasons to be, to be positive about uh, the general context in which student mobility takes place. And again, some of these points are very well known, but I think it's important that we were reminded of them uh, before delving into some of the detail. There's a mandate from governments, plural. There's a mandate 
from the central government in India in terms of quite a lot of the pronouncements and policy statements being made by India's policy commission, Niti Aayog, for example, in terms of India's science, technology and innovation policy in 2013, which places great emphasis on the importance of international research collaboration and student and faculty mobility. There is a, a, an explicit mandate from the Australian government to encourage student and faculty mobility between Australia and India. You, one sees that in the National Strategy for International Education to 2025, recently produced by the Commonwealth Government, the Department of Education and Training. One sees it in the continuing commitment, vocalised powerfully by Malcolm Turnbull in April in Delhi at a dinner that I, which I attended, uh, to invest in and support the Australia-India Strategic Research Fund, which funds research collaboration in STEM subjects between Indian researchers and Australian researchers, and has been very successful. In terms of positives, there are um, numerous memoranda of understanding between universities uh, in Australia and uh, universities in India. There's also uh, I think a significant MOU between the uh, Consortium of Universities Australia and the Association of, of Indian Universities signed recently. There is also a task force of which I'm a member set up by the group of eight universities, uh, including membership from some top universities in India to think about particularly PhD student mobility and opportunities for research collaboration and some really exciting and positive conversations that, have ha that are happening there. I was in April uh, uh, facilitating that task force work in April and again in August and I think it's, it's really positive and there's a lot of two-way interest in ways to develop particularly PhD mobility. Uh, focusing a little bit more, focusing uh, in, uh, in a little bit more detail, there are obviously numerous bilateral links between Australian universities and Indian universities, including, of course, this university, the University of Melbourne. And I'll come to some examples in a moment. There's increased migration between India and Australia. New technologies provide new opportunities to link, to spread information, to disseminate ideas. And there's a certain generational change because... Um, the, the, the waves of Indian migration to Australia have been occurring now for some time. There are th second, third, fourth, fifth generation uh, people of Indian origin in Australia. I was at a presentation where Premier Daniel Andrews was announcing the new India strategy of the Victorian government and a young man came up to me and said, look, I'm fourth generation Indian in Australia. All the conversations so far, it's just sort of, it's kind of gone that way and that way, but it hasn't really addressed me, you know, because I'm not really, uh, I'm not, I'm not a recent migrant, I'm not this, I don't really think of myself being the diaspora, but, but you know, nor am I, uh, you know, but I am of Indian origin. So the, there are new generations of young people, people with experience of the new Colombo plan, uh, devised by the Commonwealth Government, people with experience of things like the Victorian India Doctoral Scheme that the AII superintended, people with experience of the Australia-India Youth Dialogue, which has been a tremendous success, who in a sense bridge Australia and India, and for whom some of these binary kind of uh, ideas are, are not particularly helpful, a new generation of sort of cosmopolitan people who, who move between these spaces. Okay, now I want to focus in a little bit more detail. I'm sorry, it's a little bit text and information heavy, um, but uh, reassure yourself it's not going to last very long. Here's some positive uh, aspects, I think, of the potential to, to grow um, inbound student mobility from India to Australia. Some, uh, to just, you know, the, uh, I suppose, a slide that really reinforces the potential for India to be a major source of students for Australian universities. And the first and obvious point is just the size of the market, that, the, that 230,000 Indian students study abroad, but also that there are... Um, enormous numbers of young people in, in India who at the moment are, are not in, heart, in tertiary education, younger people who would like to be in tertiary education um, and who are looking for opportunities to develop skills either in vocational or higher education. And of course India 
is a country with a very long respect for education and particularly for the kinds of critical education and problem-based education that exist in Australian universities. There uh, is concern in some Australian universities over particularly uh, China as a source of students as China develops its own higher education uh, institutes and universities. There may be less logic for Chinese students to, to come to Australia. A lot of Australian universities depend upon the flow of, Indian, of, of Chinese students into their institutions uh, in terms of their, their financial viability. That's leading, I think, a lot of senior administrators in Australia to look to India as the next big source of students. In terms of positive potential and, and um, an impetus for change, um, there is obviously a lot of prior experience, a lot of very, uh, a, a very professionalised set of people who are involved in, uh, in, in student recruitment. Uh, the University of Melbourne is an obvious example. There's a very professionalised system of recruitment, often by um, agents based in other countries, that uh, provides a fantastic human infrastructure and knowledge base for then going, taking the next step and trying to improve the number of students uh, in Australia. It's roughly 46,000 Indian students I I studying in higher education in Australia at the moment. There are some e excellent existing initiatives. One thinks of the uh, Mon Monash Postgraduate Econo Academy, one thinks of the achievements of Deakin University, now over quite a considerable period of time in terms of recruiting Indian students in India and in Australia and the Melbourne India Postgraduate Programme, which has been very successful in giving PhD students the opportunity to study both in Australia and India around the problem and obtain specialist research supervision in both places. So lots of inspiring examples that uh, could catalyse uh, imitators and, and create change. In terms of positives in relation to Australian students moving to India, well, just a priori, the rising India diaspora population in Australia, globalisation generally, would make one think that there would be a rising demand for India study abroad among young people in Australia. And there are some, again, some excellent existing initiatives that I've just mentioned, which I've mentioned in the context of inbound, but also are equally important in terms of outbound uh, and opportunities for students to go to India. But there are also negatives in terms of outbound Australia to India uh, migration. There's a fairly small pool of research active universities in uh, India, which partly reflects the decision taken in the 1950s by, by Prime Minister Nehru to uh, allocate a lot of research money to specialist institutes. So a lot of the specialist research would take place outside of the university system. So there are not, there's not a huge number of institutions in India where it's possible to be, to be taught by research active faculty or world class so-called research active faculty. There's, I think, um, the, there's several studies and pieces of market research now in different parts of Australia, but I'd be interested to hear uh, your reflections in a moment that suggests that it's actually quite difficult to get Australian uni uh, university students to go to India for a year or for a whole program, type B or type C study abroad as I categorised it a few minutes ago and that the focus might perhaps best be um, placed on, on short-term intensives for Australian students going to India. There's also a sense I think at which the sort of the livability of Australia is, is in a sense sort of works against the, the grain in terms of um, Australian students going to, to India. Australian universities have relatively few of the type of twinning arrangements with Indian counterparts that exist uh, in, uh, in the case of UK universities and Indian universities or in the case of US universities and Indian universities and that creates credit transfer difficulties I suppose also then reinforces the preference for short intensives over semester-long, year-long or programme-long experiences of travelling to India. Which brings me to the, to the recommendations. And I wanted to, to, I didn't do this in the previous student mobility presentation, but I thought it would be helpful 
uh, particularly having been part of several of these kind of planning processes. Sometimes it's unclear who the recommendations are for. So I've created a list of recommendations for governments, and I haven't broken this down into central government and state government, and then a set of recommendations for um, universities. And these are very, uh, very much um, uh, offered in the spirit of seeking to revise and develop them in conversation. So in terms of recommendations for government, I think sustaining and expanding the new Colombo plan is really important. And one of the um, obvious things about policy that's worth mentioning at this point is that one can't take for granted the idea that good policy initiatives will inevitably continue in the future. And in a sense, you have to win the argument over and over again. The new Colombo plan is superb. Let's keep doing it. Let's keep trying to give opportunities uh, for student mobility uh, to, to Australian students in relation to the new Colombo plan. A second recommendation is I would incorporate PhD mobility as actually a central mandatory requirement of grants submitted to the Australia India Strategic Research Fund. Wouldn't be difficult, but have a, a PhD mobility component. Uh, if, if not mandatory, then at least make it a, a, a key uh, selection criterion. Because that's a, a, a scheme that's already very successful. I think it would be very helpful to build mobility more centrally into that program. And, with, with the rhetorical commitment to, to it that's been made by the Prime Minister, one would assume it will continue in the future. It would also, I should say parenthetically, be very helpful if the Australia-India Strategic Research Fund could embrace HASS as well as STEM, though I think that's less likely to happen. It's really important to fund a greater number of scholarships, uh, scholarships for Indian students to come to Australia, particularly in a context where uh, the Indian government does not provide the, the scholarships for PhD study that the Chinese government provide to Chinese students who want to come and study in Australia. I think it's important um, for the government to, within Australia, transform school students' understanding of India via, uh, via education about India and through providing mobility experiences at the school level. I know a lot of moves have been made by the Victoria State Government in these directions through new, new citizenship programs uh, and also through trying to think about how some of the mobility programs that exist already for students, school students to travel to China could be uh, resourced in relation to India. And I also think, fifthly, and, and um, someone accused me recently of constantly appealing to people's higher angels. I, I do think it's important to try to reset the narrative around why we're interested in, in student mobility, to, to move it away simply from a commercial objective or from a commercial objective sort of dressed up a little bit in, in terms of warm words about exchange, to actually thinking about addressing a key Asia challenge. And that challenge is the challenge of providing opportunities in the short to medium term for enormous youth demographic in India that are excluded from the opportunities that a lot of students growing up in Australia are able to avail of, to be taught by research active faculty, to work in vibrant interdisciplinary universities. In terms of recommendations for universities, again, there are five. Uh, part, so, some of these relate to uh, cre creating infrastructure and activity that would then be conducive to encouraging student mobility rather than focusing on stu student mobility per se. So the first one would be to explore opportunities for collaborative grants. In my experience, we're, we're not, maybe not quite as fleet of foot or proactive as, as we might be uh, across uh, Australian universities at looking at things like the Imprint India initiative, which provides funding for uh, research on 10 key, in 10 key fields, and particularly there's a, there's a, there's a pivot there to encouraging research between inter Indian and, international and foreign researchers. Uh, I was looking today again at the RCUK India uh, research grant collaboration, which has led to um, projects totaling 230 million pounds since, since 2008 on really fantastic topics. I haven't dug into how many Australian researchers have been involved in those grants. But remember, when one's thinking about Australia and India, we shouldn't sort of fall into a, a, a sort of default bilateralism. There may be lots of opportunities to partner with other countries, with other researchers, in terms of encouraging student mobility and in generating the 
the collaborative international research, which then provides a foundation for student <coughs> mobility in the future. I think it's, it's, um, it's really important to develop curricula to, to think about opportunities to create uh, subject or program material for Indian students, for example, that doesn't assume that those Indian students have to actually travel to Australia. The obvious example is online uh, learning, and, and the University of Melbourne have been a has been a pioneer in this space, but I'm also thinking about um, blended degrees, for example, where faculty from a university in Australia collaborate with faculty in an Indian <coughs> university or consortium of Indian universities to develop curricula that are then um, delivered in India and there's a blended Bachelor of Science degree that's offered with science, the science faculty here at the University of, Mo of, of Melbourne and the University of Pune and some constituent colleges that is precisely um, developing this BSc, uh, this blended BSc. There's also opportunities for faculty within Australia to deliver material in India, for example, via the Global Initiative of Academics Network, the Gyan. Gyan, of course, in Hindi means knowledge, so it's a neat little acronym thing going on here. Uh, I, I, again, I don't know, and it'd be interesting to hear from the audience how many Australian academics have taken advan advantage of Gyan and what its potential might be, but I think that's really important. We, universities could think again in earnest, and I know the University of Queensland's thinking about this at the moment, about developing B PhD programs built on the Monash model, the Monash Academy model, uh, joint PhD programs. Uh, I think it's really important that universities uh, invest in scholarships. There's a moral argument for doing that in a context where universities are making a lot of money out of international students. There's a student experience argument that can be made on that basis, that actually it would enhance all students' experience in Australian universities if the population that was coming from, of students that was coming from other countries was diverse, not only in terms of nationality, but in terms of class and gender background. So uh, some sense of uh, uh, broadening the, the flow, say, of Indian students out with uh, the elite to, to, um, to think about you know, how many, I, I don't know the people in the room who will know, but how many uh, low castes from India getting opportunities to study in Australian universities, how many women. I know, um, I'll, and I'll say parenthetically, there are certainly universities in the UK that have become much less diverse in terms of, of uh, social economic status as they've become more diverse in terms of nationality. So thinking about multiple axes of social difference and inequality, and particularly thinking about how through scholarships to develop that deep reach into provincial India is, I think, uh, to use an Indian expression, the need of the hour. One way practically that universities in Australia could do this is through partnering with some of the elite private universities that are emerging, emerging now in India and who themselves are thinking quite a lot about questions of access and of, of uh, developing regional links, even within the state universities and, and colleges affiliated with them. So new private universities like Ashoka University are really, try, really trying to create a better regional educational ecosystem. Well, Australian universities could partner with universities like that to develop structured pathways for students to get from some of the uh, very poorly resourced state colleges to private universities perhaps in India for a master's and then for a PhD in Australia and then they could go back to the regions to help to uh, address the demand for experienced faculty in those regions. Finally, I think it's important to empower faculty. One of the underlying messages of what I'm saying today is the need to think over the long term and, and set goals for, a ten, for, for 10, 20, 30 years hence. And it's often faculty, in my experience, who, uh, are, uh, uh, you know, who are engaged in these kinds of issues over those kinds of timescales. Senior executives and, 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 and professional staff within universities, yes, but often faculty are really important in that process of sustaining uh, long-term initiative, absorbing setbacks uh, and continuing to... I don't know how many professions are like this, but academics, I think, are one of the few that actually carry on turning up for work when they cease to be paid. So it's, uh, I think this, 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 this is... The, the empowering faculty is really absolutely critical. How do you empower faculty? Well, you rationalise teaching. Australian universities compare 
generally rather unfavorably to UK universities and uh, US universities in terms of leave policy, in terms of allowing faculty to stack teaching in a single semester, so to free them up to travel. Uh, I should, no, I, I won't say that. There's all sorts of things I, I think maybe I should say, and I, I, I won't say that. But I think, you know, there's the, um, a, a real need to sort of, to, to think about empowering faculty through creating opportunities for them to travel, to spend long periods or, or, or medium or short-term periods in, in places like India. And one could also incentivize uh, faculty to um, engage in research collaboration and efforts to encourage student mobility, if that is indeed a strategic goal. And a lot of the interesting initiatives, a few of which I've mentioned in terms of Australia-India research collaboration and student mobility collaboration, for example, the, Mohan, the, the um, the Monash Academy, the, the MIP and MIPA and, and others, of course, have involved a, a wide range of people, but they've often had at their heart faculty who've really been very keen at driving these things forward. So general points underpinning both the recommendations for government and, and university uh, are, first of all, that um, outbound mobility might usefully focus on intensives at all levels. So, thinking about giving, at least in the, in the short to medium term, short, you know, uh, week, two week, three week experiences to uh, students and faculty at all levels. Inbound might also usually, usefully focus on intensives as a means to recruit to longer term um, programs or courses. Third, I think uh, it's implicit in what I said about scholarships and partnering with private universities. Is it's important to think about mobility, not only in terms of mobility between Australia and India, but also mobility within Australia and within India. Uh, the, the, to, to return to an um, idea that I expressed um, some concern about at the beginning, uh, the, the, the culture shock of... Um, uh, going to Delhi is much less than the culture shock that I get when I, when I go um, 60 kilometres uh, northeast into to Meerut. That's um, thinking about mobility across that boundary as well as mobility across um, from the metropolitan parts of India to big cities in Australia is really important. And I need to reflect on why we're encouraging mobility to set long term and generational goals. So um, some of the headwinds, some of the challenges that implementing these recommendations and, and, um, and developing those under commi underpinning commitments might face. Uh, well, the first and rather sort of relatively technical point um, is uh, that, that the, the institutions that faculty would like to develop research collaborations within, with in India are different often from the institutions from which uh, Australian universities should in the long term be thinking about recruiting students from. So Chaudhry Charan Singh University in Meerut, for example, has, uh, I think, about 400,000 students affiliated to it through its various private and government colleges. But it's not a university that faculty here are likely to, to develop close research collaborations with. Secondly, there is, I think, at some levels at least, in some Australian universities, a very strong um, uh, impetus to engage with tier one, so-called tier one universities in India, by which I mean the sort of cent the central universities, the JNUs, the Delhi universities, the IITs, the IIMs, and, and even that sometimes formalised in university policy or in faculty policy. So, that, so there is an, an institutionalised elitism in the way that Australia is engaging with Indian universities. Now that. There, there are obviously some very good reasons for that historically. I think it needs to be problematized in terms of the long-term agenda that I'm thinking about of um, tapping a global talent. Student recruitment tends to happen for, again, very obvious reasons um, in silos. It's, it's the responsibility of individual universities in Australia. And this also reflects the manner in which the university system in Australia has evolved so that you have effectively whatever it is, 35 universities, they're all structurally and in terms of the course offerings very similar. So it's not like you'll have a, a specialist university of medicine collaborating with a specialist university of the humanities to then go into India and, and, and develop a, a joint approach. It's much more, in, in my view so far, uh, competitive. 
you know, it's, it's, it's one university that looks quite similar to a second university competing for uh, the student dollar from India. And that individualization militates against the kind of collaborative, long-term approach that I think is necessary if one's really serious about mobility of students from uh, regional India into Australia. There, there are curricular impediments. One has to, of course, and I know a great deal of thought has gone into this in lots of Australian universities, not new, but, but it's worth remembering that if, if you're bringing lots of new students from, uh, from, from countries uh, like India into Australian universities, you need to think about what they're being taught here and uh, not just about their sort of so-called acculturation or acclimatisation to the Australian scene, and, and there's a lot of uh, important initiative there, both in terms of universities and in terms of government, but, but also actually think seriously about what it means for curricula. To what extent are there Indian case studies, India-based, South Asia-based case studies where students are learning about business and economics? To what extent are the case studies of India where, people, where students are learning about health? Because if those case studies aren't there, or if that material isn't there in some form, then uh, you know, it's, it's, it's reproducing a problem in India of alien curricula associated with colonialism, of alien curricula being imposed upon students who can't see its relevance. So it's not a question of having lots of courses about Nehru and Gandhi, the India 101, operating in Australian universities, those, though those would be nice, but it's also about using India as a lens through which to think about your field and developing those opportunities in the context of seeing increasing numbers of Indian students coming into Australian universities. Fifth, I think built into the way in which lots of us operate and the way in which lots of us are encouraged to operate is a kind of short-termism. Academia, uh, to my mind, is, is, is a profession where no one ever tells you what it's in your long-term interest to do. No one tells you what it's in your long-term interest to do. It might be my long-term interest to learn China, to learn. Mandarin, and to develop a comparative project between China and India. But to do that, I'd have to turn my back on all kinds of important deliverables and, and badges of success that one has to demonstrate on a one-yearly, two-yearly basis. So how can one actually try to enrol people who are interested in this long-term project to doing something structurally very difficult that will involve compromise, that will involve setbacks, that does involve risk, it does involve, say, starting 11 projects and finding only three and a half work. It's difficult. It's difficult, actually, because of the way in which the institutional habitus of the university works, the way in which we're encouraged to think about performance indicators, the way we're encouraged to measure, badge uh, our progress through universities. And finally, I think... Uh, there is, you know, in, in, in Australia, but also more broadly in, the, in, in this current global moment, uh, a pivot towards STEM, which some people may well, may well defend, but unfortunately plays into a very long-term pivot to STEM that exists in India, where humanities and social sciences are systematically and in a very gendered way devalued within major institutions and devalued not within society, but within, well, to some extent within society, but certainly within higher educational institutions. And, and that prevents the kind of problem-centered research that's really important in terms of providing a, a, an operational logic to student mobility. Uh, and it, you know, it, al it also prevents interdisciplinarity. When we tend to think about the problem of interdisciplinarity, we tend to think about structures. What we need is a new institute that will bridge different faculties, or we need to create a new virtual initiative around this amazing theme. And in Australia, that makes complete sense, because in Australia, physicists trust and like uh, people in the, in the humanities and history, and historians trust and like physicists. Now, in India, I think there's a double problem. Uh, and one doesn't want to generalise too much, and certainly within IITs and with, with top institutions like the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, there are some very exciting initiatives in this, in this area, and indeed some other institutes, uh, such as the ones um, that we've been trying to build links with at the, at the Institute. But, but in general, in, uh, in India, there's both a lack of the organisational structures for effective interdisciplinarity and a lack of the fundamental respect for different disciplines that is the soil in which interdisciplinary projects can grow. So I'm sorry to end on a negative note, but I do think that if one's serious about developing the, the, the projects uh, and, and um, if one blurs one's eyes when looking at the recommendations and thinks, what are the wider goals here, 
that, that there are some, there is a need to take stock and think about actually the, op the, the operational logic of universities, the way in which our careers are structured, uh, the, the need um, to balance imperatives across different time scales, uh, which takes us you know, back to that idea of you know, the institutional habitus and, and the need um, to, to almost sort of look, at, look at outside oneself and think, is, this, is the whole way in which I'm operating uh, conducive to the kind of long-term project that's implied by uh, the goal of encouraging not just students' physical mobility, but also uh, social mobility across Australia and India. So thank you very much for listening to me. I hope we'll have some time for questions. I think I'm chairing my own questions. If, uh, if, uh, Ravi, do you want to, to go first? We do have a ro If you could wait for the roving mic, thank you. Craig, that was a fantastic lecture. It's, I could say it's easily one of the best I've attended. So thank you very much for that. Um, well, just stop there, Ravi. I'm sure that. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, uh, one of the headwinds we face is that there is significant inconsistency in policy of the government. It changes every six months. I can tell you from personal experience that there is, uh, within India, a huge latent demand and desire to come and study in Australia, and in particular, in Australian universities. I deal with, with those students every day. However, the Department of Immigration thinks otherwise. And it has got a policy called GTE. The student has to prove that he's a genuine temporary entrant. So it starts with a negative hypothesis, and all the paperwork and all the processes relate to student trying to prove that he's coming temporarily, and the Department of Immigration and the embassy is saying, no, 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 you're a thief. You're, you're coming to migrate to Australia. And then, then the battle starts, right? And I've seen rejection notices and acceptance notices, and I've seen it for 35 countries, right? And I can, I'm, I mean, if I can summarize them for you, mm. uh, you would be laughing your head off. This is why you're coming to Australia to study this subject. It's offered in your own country at a cheaper mm. price. Mm. It ranges from that mm. to so many, many other ridiculous uh, propositions mm. that are made. Mm. So in your recommendations, perhaps if you can also put in consistency of policy that is not changed every six months. Every mm. six months, mm. the admission level of a country is changed, level one, two, and three. And mm. if you are placed in three, God help you. You've got snowball's chance in hell of getting in, right? And, uh, and so on. So that perhaps is a very important factor. Mm. And, and the demand is there. The students want to come in. The Australian universities are good. Mm. The other factors are within our control. We can address them. But that particular factor is outside any academic's control. Thanks so much, Ravi. I take that as a comment. I think there's someone immediately behind you who wants to maybe come in on this precise point. Um, I think just to follow on from his point, um, it's exactly right that in my own experience, I came here in 2008 as mm. an international student. Mm -hmm. um, I was a serious student. I was sold a dream by mm. the education recruiters, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because there is a specific agenda that they have, that mm. they have to produce these many number of students mm -hmm. who are coming mm -hmm. from India. Mm -hmm. I was a high achieving student and I worked very, very hard here. I achieved a GPA of 3.8 on four mm -hmm. in my undergraduate degree. And as soon as I finished my education, I started, okay, I would like to stay back and build a career here. Mm. What opportunities are available to me? Mm. The first obstacle was, well, you can't do anything. You're on an international visa, you need to apply for a PR, mm. right? Mm. So I spent six months of my life simply preparing for a PR while teaching at a university. Mm. Mm. So that, that's not productive in mm. any way. Mm. And then as soon as I stepped out of the boundaries, the hallowed halls of mm. University of Melbourne into the real life, mm. um, there was a very strong push very strong push, call it racial, call it any, anything you want to, mm. towards either go back to studying or go back to your country. Because mm. there is no life for you as an Indian person here outside the university. So when you talk about the mobility of students and building and fostering sustainable relationships between India and Australia, a very important aspect of it is giving them respect welcoming them here, not just as cash cows or people who are c coming here to carry out the research, but actually letting them be human beings. Only then will they be able to produce and live productively. 
Even now, I'm a citizen now, I have an Aussie passport, and it's been four years, but still now I'm trying to foster links with the ABC as a media and communication student. And I'm facing exactly the same challenges that I was 10 years ago. Like nothing has changed for me in this country. Um, hello, I work for engineering, and so naturally a lot of our interaction with India so far has been with the IITs and with mm. other elite institutions. Mm. Um, and I found it really interesting what you were saying, and I've heard similar discussion from our academics in mm. that it's un or unfortunate in a way that we're only interacting with these elite institutions. Mm. Mm. Um, I'm wondering, have you noticed any sort of push or any other interest in, uh, I suppose, uh, identifying other institutions that aren't at that elite level, that aren't IITs, for, for yeah. example? Yeah. Or do you know any way that maybe I could try to encourage that, those sort of connections between our faculty. Yeah. I think at the moment they're very um, risk averse might have been the phrase you used earlier. Yeah, you should, you should pass the microphone to, to my colleague, Professor <laughs> Priya Rangan, who can give you chapter and verse uh, on this topic. I'd to hear that and, and <laughs> I'd like your card and I'll be happy to chat with you because I've been talking to engineering about broadening their, their focus from just the IITs to equally top notch institutions of information technology where you could do very, very important, you know, interesting study exchange programs. You know, you could build up a whole range of connections in the engineering sector mm -hmm. um, with non-IITs or even, if you like, some of the young and new IITs that are coming up. But mm -hmm. uh, some of your, some of the colleagues who were open to the idea, were immediately told that they were not the top tier institutions and therefore they could not proceed, even though we were in India and they said they couldn't proceed with those discussions. So I'm very happy to hear that you are willing to push that case with the engineering faculty. We would love to be able to work with you on that. I think it's probably also worth in that context just remembering that, that point I tried to thread through the talk and mentioned explicitly at one point of, about not, not the sort of avoiding a kind of knee-jerk bilateralism where one thinks oh, it's, it's us and we interact with that institution because I think one thing I've learned from Priya and her work is actually, you know, actually how a lot of these elite institutions are themselves already networked with, with a lot of other institutions. So, so engaging with the elite institution could, could be the bridge into other types of hub and spoke type collaborations I talked about in terms of, sort of developing a regional educational ecosystem. Uh, and, and that might actually be the, the best way to approach it is, is to, you know, and, and actually it's also then a, a nice way to tell the, a university like the University of Melbourne, which is very interested in its own regional outreach, look, there's opportunities for you to think about your regional outreach in relation to, say, how, you know, the University of Pune or the Indian Institute of Science thinks it's about, about its regional outreach. There's some really opportunity. In fact, I want to put in a... Or maybe, I don't think this is secret, I want to put in a discovery project to the, to the Australian Research Council looking at exactly this question of how one creates regional educational ecosystems in, in India. Robert, I will come back to you. I think, I think maybe we should, I'm, I'm a little bit conscious of time that we've overrun. Should we stop? Yeah. So um, I'll hang around just for a couple of minutes if anyone has any further questions. Thank you for your forbearance, for coming this evening, for braving the rain. Uh, and please do stay in contact if you're interested in any of these ideas, because I'm really serious about, you know, I think it's th these are s such important things to keep thinking about. Thanks.